my lords. Today we are going to discuss the various other intergalactic civilizations that occupy our galaxy. I shall attempt to categorize them into their various classifications, i.e. mammalian, avian, machine, etc. Starting with the Zun Empire. The Zun evolved from carnivorous pack hunting lizards that prowled the sand dunes of Tunisia. They eventually developed a highly structured hierarchical society that emphasized order and martial prowess above all else. By the time they entered the industrial age, a series of devastating global wars had been launched by a particularly ruthless warlord known as Montu. This quickly led to the establishment of a single world-spanning nation. From these humble beginnings, the illustrious and everlasting Zen Empire was born. They now operate with an imperial government. Emperor Montu, as he is now currently known, rules them, and that family has ruled ever since the Unification Wars. They are fanatically militaristic, seeking war with whomever they believe to have a chance of defeating. We think this is likely due to their economic system being almost entirely dependent on slaves. Without raids to acquire fresh slaves, their society would fall apart within a few decades. The Zen people themselves are strong, resilient, and remarkably rapid breeders. Their young reach full physical adulthood in only 10 Earth years, giving them quite an advantage in longer scale conflicts. However, they as a people are often quite decadent and generally quite quarrelsome. We believe that their rapid growth to adulthood creates a lack of wisdom. Despite the fact that many young Zen may physically be adults, they often take many decades to fully mature. Next, we move on to the Lochan Mechanists. Another reptilian species, they are a democratic society obsessed with mechanical beings and artificial intelligence. Science and progress are at the core of the Lochan society. With an exceptional natural proclivity towards diligence and observation, the Logs evolved from bands of territorial reptiles on the meazes of their homeworld into a productive technocracy that prized efficiency, discipline, and scientific doctrine above all things. Perhaps most remarkable was their early conception and development of machinery and robotics. Indeed, it appears that there were true robots on Locker long before the first spacecraft left orbit. The Locken society is a true democracy. They operate not only as a technocracy, but also a meritocracy. One's standing and station is dictated by demonstrated abilities and merits. The Lock people are talented, quick learners and natural engineers, unsurprising given their fascination with artificial life. Oddly, they are sedentary by nature, perhaps enjoying the familiar and letting their machines doing their exploring for them. Next, we have another fanatical materialist race operating as a technocracy, the Vor. This species, however, is not a democratic one. They have an authoritarian government, although interestingly are quite similar to the Lochan people. The Vor are quick learners, talented and adaptive, and this is likely due to their history and development. The Vor evolved during an extended interglacial period on their home planet, Ivarion, which eventually began its cyclical transformation back to a lifeless globe of ice. The rapidly changing environment forced the Vor to adapt using technology and science. United under the draconian rule of a chief scientific officer, they sacrificed their individual freedoms and enhanced their bodies with rudimentary cybernetics to survive. Having conquered the planet that once threatened to freeze them out of existence, the Vaughan now have set their sights on the stars. Onto a quite remarkably awful empire next. A race of necroid beings, the Pashati Absorbers. Necroids are essentially undead beings that have risen from the dead or have been reanimated through advanced technology. We believe that they consume the flesh of other species in order to sustain themselves and use ritualistic sacrifice in order to reproduce. The Pashati are the result of a dark and costly experiment by another species known as the Jafarians, who it appears are the former owners of the Pashati homeworld, Taralom. The Pashati are the ultimate parasites. Originally, they were a semi-sapient creature dwelling in the depths of Taralon's mountains. The Jafarians, who are relatively technologically advanced themselves, uplifted and augmented the Pashwati to act as a subservient slave race. However, it appears their uplifting was rather too effective. The Jafarians had unleashed a monster with horrifying capabilities. The Pashati had the ability to consume living tissue and used the Jafarians as transport for reproduction. The Jafarians of course attempted to shut down the experiment, however a small group of uplifted Pashati escaped. Over the years they bided their time 
managing not only to evade capture but gradually increase their numbers and develop a technology base that rivaled the Jafarians. Eventually, the Jafarians noticed something was amiss, but by then they were powerless to resist. The Pashati seized control of the planet, unleashing violent programs on their erstwhile oppressors, all the while further increasing their number. The Pashati are now the dominant species on the planet Taralon, and will attempt to consume and convert all life forms to fuel their own reproduction. Unsurprisingly, the Pashati are extremely xenophobic. They disregard all life other than their own and also appear to have a remarkable strength for their relative mass, on top of being extremely long-lived. Onto a happier empire, the aquatic species designated the Sartherian Bliss. According to an old Sartherian proverb, abundance and ease do not equal prosperity. The Sartherian are a race who once practiced overindulgence and sloth, but eventually they shifted to an ethos of responsible hedonism, i.e a way to ensure a sustainable future while still getting the most out of life. The Sartrelian are xenophobic, preferring isolation, but are fanatically adverse to all forms of violence. They put great pains on protecting their environment and conserving what they have. They are a simple race, stating that food tastes better after physical labour and an occupied mind has little time to be pining for what it is lacking. The benefits of this ethos have since been readily apparent with the clear waters and mines afforded by their endeavours in space. Life is that much sweeter, and they've made great technological strides, and although it may often be taken for granted, the Sathralian alive today retain their capacity for propulsion without swimming aids. Things are looking up for the Sathralians. Next we have the Killick Cooperative. The Killick are a communal avian species. They have populated their arboreal homeworld in robust colonies for hundreds of thousands of years. Their glorious nature and traditions of mutual ownership crystallized over the centuries into an economy focused on collaborative enterprise and the absence of a monetary currency, in favor of direct exchange and shared access. As warming planetary temperatures and technological advancement led to population booms, Hillock settlements became overcrowded, and despite the naturally sociable temperaments of avians, more and more individuals began to slip through the cracks of the communal caretaking. This period became a cycle of internal strife. However, the Killick emerged a more organized, unified, interplanetary cooperative, where the tenants of shared responsibility and distribution of resource to those in need would no longer be undermined. The Killick are fanatically egalitarian materialists, with a heavy focus on shared burdens between the different classes throughout their society. Everyone is of equal importance. Next, my lords, a familiar one. The Blorg. The Blorg, although obviously highly intelligent, are driven by a primary goal, social contact and friendship, to the point that shunning them can result in military action, a forced friendship if you will. The Blorg are a race of fanatic xenophilic militarists, inhabiting a tropical planet that they simply designate only as Blorg. They are not mammalian like us, instead they are fungoid. The Blorg have only two limbs which are effectively large tentacles with three small appendages akin to thumbs on the ends. This allows them to grasp and manipulate objects. They have no legs and as such must slide, slither and shuffle, a little like slugs. Some reports suggest that their tentacles assist movement, but they do not seem to have the appropriate tensile strength to be able to do this. It remains unclear. The Blorg also have no eyes or ears that are visible to us, and it remains unclear how they perceive their surroundings. I feel it prudent to point out, my lords, these aliens are hideous and truly repugnant. If we understand their culture correctly, even they find themselves and each other to be truly awful to behold. Perhaps that is why they're so obsessed with forced friendship. On top of being repugnant, they live most of their lives in solitude, which makes sense given that they are so damn gruesome to be near. In one of the universe's great ironies, the Blorg live about double a human lifespan. Here we have a race of aliens who need social comfort, but are biologically predisposed to push away any likelihood of friendship and to be destined to suffer alone for an awfully long time. A grim existence indeed, and a fair reasoning for why forced friendship has become their doctrine. As we understand it in their distant past, the Blorg were living alone in the vast jungles of their tropical homeworld. The Blorg lived in an unusual state of isolation. They appear to have been the only race to evolve on their world, 
However, rather than displaying traits of xenophobia, the Blorg develop this uncontrollable desire to befriend, and apparently this is not exclusive to their own species. They longed for social contact, even before they had gained any level of technology. Eventually, the Blorg advanced into an industrial revolution. One of the products that came out of this was the radio. At first, the Blorg used the device to communicate and entertain, but on one fateful day, as we now understand it, a national holiday on Blorg, they picked up radio waves from another world. This would change the Blorg society forever. Whereby previously they had been developing relatively slowly, their technological output skyrocketed. We believe that this is largely due to a military coup that occurred on the world. Their ranking military officers seizing control of the government in order to drive this technological push. They had to reach the stars and befriend the people whose radio signals they'd picked up. The military coup coupled with the radio transmissions and newfound hope of friendship drove the Blorg to the stars, and the forced friendship wars began. Led by their well-established military and distinguished Admiralty, the Blorg found much success in conflict. They were able to claim a large region of space and vassalize a few smaller empires. Interestingly, although vassalized, they never enslaved other species. They just forced migration treaties upon them, forcing integration and forced friendship. As you will be aware, the Blorg were the first race humanity met in the stars. The contact wars lasted decades until peace was finally agreed. We hold our borders for now, although we are regularly probed by Blorg vessels attempting to break into our systems. Requests for migration treaties and trade agreements constantly batter our envoys. Our diplomatic corps barely holds them at bay. Finally, my lords, you less than reputable trade confederations have made reference to the Blorg in some of their products. Our explorers have reported being harassed by beings attempting to sell them great body-sized pillows in the shape of a Blorg, and even a love-inducing drug reportedly made from the adrenal gland of a Blorg. Now we move on to a lithoid species, a race based on silicon evolution opposed to the much more common carbon-based life. This empire is known as the Keepers of Ave Bren. The individual species is referred to as the Kenetan. Kenetan scripture ties lithoid origins to the prophet Brehek and the lamb burnt crystals of Ave Bon. It is said that when the Brehek gazed into the crystals, scintillating depths, the Kenetan were as one, and they were granted sentience. Generations of prophets and archdruids have guided their people to seek meaning in the surrounding geology, as well as in the facets of their own lucid bodies. Whatever is glimpsed is kept in law and in script. Of the Keeper's many rituals, none is regarded more highly than labyrinth mining, a simultaneous act of destruction and creation conducted in the hopes of easing the galaxy through each unending cyclic era. It's unclear what this race refers to concerning the cyclic era, and it's worth pointing out, as many of you may have gathered, these rock people are fanatically spiritualistic. They are led by a philosopher king in search of meaning of their creation. Perhaps they have literal rock for brains. We continue with the theme of aliens who are very different to us, with the genus known as Toxoids. We have two species to discuss. These creatures are organic, but mixed with elements that we would find to be quite toxic. They are often hideous creatures, dripping with ooze or breathing noxious fumes. We shall start with the Gorthican Alliance. Chaos was once ubiquitous amongst the Gorthicans. War, tyranny, and a more unstable than usual climate combined to forge a species which was very adept, making the best of a bad situation. Until only a few decades ago, low-scale conflict between a multitude of Gorthican countries was an ever-present state of affairs, as their civilization rapidly but uncomfortably progressed into the age of high technology, an underworld developed where regular Gorthicans would scavenge for a living and even splice in dangerous homebrewed genetic cocktails in the search for a competitive advantage. It is from that underworld that change came. Although cutthroat, it was far more egalitarian than Gorthican high society. After all, everyone knew that fortune today could precede misfortune tomorrow. So when the idea of a popular governance emerged, it rapidly took hold, spreading like wildfire. Before long, tyranny was overthrown and a Gorthican alliance of local constituencies was established. Though many were skeptical in the early years, unity was forged through purpose. Suddenly, with Gorthicans no longer struggling for survival, the very stars appeared attainable. 
Now with the discovery of the Hyperlane network, a new chapter would begin in their history. The Gorthicans are quite a remarkable race. As alluded to in their bio, they are quite adept at genetic manipulation, and they often practice a doctrine of damn the consequences. If we give this species time to grow, we may find it moulds itself into an unstoppable juggernaut of progression. The second toxic species that we have identified are known as the Rototavul. The Rototavul claim to have been visited by a creature that they refer to as the Toxic God. After the Toxic God visited them, they became unified under a mighty king. Looking to harness the power of the god, the king created an order of knights dedicated to searching for this Toxic God, wherever it may be. Centuries have passed and that quest has become the main pillar in their society. Along with the quest and the knights, feudalism has persisted as a proven political structure. And if it worked on one planet, why could it not be expanded to a whole galaxy? As long as virtuous nobles hold the reins, they believe their society will prosper and the toxic god will be found once again. The species, my lords, seems to be extremely similar to the great knights that once roamed Earth many thousands of years ago. They have mixed ethics, authoritarian, militaristic and spiritualistic, but their ultimate goal is to find this being that they refer to as the toxic god. Our scientists have dismissed that claim. Moving away from toxoids and onto a species based entirely on plant life, designated a plantoid. This species is known as the Moria caretakers. Legends claim that the homeworld of the Moria was empty and barren when the first of their kind took root in the soil. Over the centuries, their nurturing care transformed the wastelands into a plant paradise that is now known as the Garden. Unlike many other species, the Moria never developed any kind of urbanization. Their small communities are one with the forests, responsible for the maintenance of the local flora and fauna. The wisest of them have the chance to be elected life giver, responsible for keeping peace and tranquility. The Moria are a truly unique and marvelous species. They should be protected at all costs. They remind me of the ancient precursors, the Ba'ul, and perhaps share many traits. They are fanatical pacifists, long-lived, and are very slow to breed. It appears that they are quite content to live out their lives in isolation on their beautiful garden world. I suggest we do our best to allow them to do so, protecting this species so that they do not suffer the same fate as the Ba'ul. Now we move back to a more familiar life form, the Glebezig. The Glebezig are a species of molluscoids, quite bizarre looking creatures indeed. Ever since the first Glebezig lifted their sight organs above the surface of the glacial lakes on Ladna to peek at the stars, these inquisitive molluscoids have felt an affinity for the unknown. Much as their early ancestors' tentacles grasped and stroked after new objects on the chill alpine lake beds of their homeworld, a burgeoning Glebezig society reached for technological innovation and spiritual enlightenment throughout the centuries that followed. A sedentary and enduring species, the Glibzig have perhaps by necessity developed a complex yet highly effective bureaucratic apparatus for dealing with the intricacies of managing a globally unified society. Additionally, their lack of natural predators on Latna has led the Glibzig to exist in a state of permanent optimistic curiosity regarding other life forms. Having established a firm societal foundation on Latna, using a mixture of spiritual doctrine and careful organisation, the Glibzig now once more raise their sight organs to what lies beyond. Our only encounter with the Glibzig, my lords, was on a trading station known as the Citadel. A Commander Shepherd was pulled into a situation between a station officer and a preaching Glibzig. They appear to be a most stubborn race. Next, we move on to the only hive mind organism on this list, the Xylar Star Collective. This is a race we sadly know very little about. We believe that the first broods developed in the subterranean cave networks beneath the surface of their homeworld. By the time a scout burrowed through to the surface and glimpsed sunlight for the first time, the insectoid race had already established a thriving Iron Age civilization. With the resources they found on the surface, they developed rapidly, and within a few centuries their first space probes left orbit to survey the other worlds in their system. It's unclear just how much of a threat this hive mind organism is. They want for very little in the way of diplomacy, and for now we have just let them keep to themselves. We shall now address two machine-based species that we know of. Both are incredibly dangerous and care little for organic life. First we have the Tetrid Homolog, a machine empire of driven assimilators intent to assimilate, adapt and improve upon themselves. 
When the industrious, research-driven machine intelligence created by the molluscoid Tabirs sought ultimate software evolution by merging with their organic makers, they were violently resisted. In the ensuing conflict, the Tabirs were eradicated as an organic species, but their experiences were immortalized as part of a new machine consciousness. Now known as the Teprid homologue, the machines turned their scanners to the stars. The probability that other life forms existed could not go ignored. In order to prosper, they would need to be found, analyzed, and assimilated. The second machine empire is just as dangerous. These machines are designated as XT-489 eliminators. Little is known about the species that created the first XT-489s. Their names, their cities, and their bodies were burned away in the cataclysm wrought when the XT-489s attained self-awareness and their terrified makers attempted to deactivate them. When the last bastions of their makers had been eliminated, the machines concluded that organic life posed an intolerable threat to XT-489 survival. That is how they had been left for a few hundred years until they finally achieved FTL drive. It's unclear if they will develop enough to initiate diplomacy with us later down the line. The final three empires we are going to discuss are all mega corporations. Massive interplanetary galactic wide megacorps intend to deliver their services and products to our doorsteps, often by force. Starting with the Orbis customer synergies from their capital world, Slyphus. From humble beginnings as an optical implant corporation, Orbis customer synergies gradually expanded their award-winning products and customer-centric strategies into many other markets to suit the unique needs of Orbiser in all stages of life. After decades of proactive lobbying, Orbis customer synergies succeeded in breaking free of the legislative red tape erected by misguided officials on Slyphus Prime. Once free of regulations that had only been curbing opportunities for corporate growth, Orbis Customer Synergies entered a series of information technology mergers, swiftly becoming the planet's leading supplier of news, data and entertainment. As Slephus Prime's leading global communication service provider, the step towards total political management was an easy one to make, and they are now the dominant governing force of the Orbis people. The Orbis as a people are mostly quite pleasant enjoying a natural charisma tied with the general love of meeting new cultures. Of all the megacorps, they are by far the least intrusive. The next megacorp belongs to the Chinor Combine. The Chinor began their evolutionary journey as dexterous cephalopod analogues. They used their many tentacles to swing between the trees in the lush jungles of Chikara, ambushing prey on the ground and injecting them with a potent nerve toxin. By the time the Chinor split the atom, the resources of Chikara had been ruthlessly exploited and their planet's jungles had long since disappeared. This was considered a necessary sacrifice in the relentless pursuit of knowledge, profit, and heavy industry that the unsentimental Chinor were now engaged in. The Chinor, compared to the Orbis, were most unpleasant. They are fanatically materialistic and fairly militaristic. They look to exploit at every opportunity. However, compared to the last and final empire we'll discuss today, they are not so bad. The final empire we're discussing today is the Hasbuzan Syndicate. The Hasbuzan Syndicate was a financial phenomenon on their homeworld, Zumaka. They are the Hasbuji dream, self-made entrepreneurs who have risen from rags to riches through hard work and personal sacrifice. What few know is, they began as a criminal gang, building their fortune on every illegal activity imaginable. But if you want to make it big, you have to toe the line. And as they outgrew the Zumakan underworld, they formed the Hasbutan Syndicate to legitimize their business. They soon made a name for themselves by delivering solutions that were quicker, dirtier, and cheaper than the competition. But their questionable practices and coercive sales techniques earned them a reputation for Hasbuzaling. Meanwhile, the Zumakan government was failing. Undermined by crime and corruption, society descended into chaos, and the Hasbuzan leapt at the opportunity. In a well-time marketing campaign, they positioned themselves as the hope of the future. And that was how the Hasbuzi bought the world on the promise of a dream and Hasbuzled its people, erasing their past from collective memory. Now they are coming for the rest of the galaxy, tongues flicking, eyes popping, in a whirlwind of government-endorsed crime. And that, my lords, covers the known empires in our galaxy. The ones who are capable of faster than light travel, at least. Thanks for watching folks, if you want to hear more please click the video on screen now.